Possible Poetry – ein Podcast über neue Welten und Wege in der Poesie mit Dirk Hülstrunk. Possible Poetry – a podcast about new worlds and roads of poetry with your host Dirk Hülstrunk. Welcome to the second episode of Possible Poetry, a podcast about new worlds and paths of poetry. My name is Dirk Hülstrunk. I am an author, translator and cultural activist from Frankfurt am Main. This episode will be completely in English. But I hope I can provide a transcript and some detailed info with the show notes on our Podigy blog. In this podcast... I want to introduce you to international artists and projects that take particularly innovative new paths in poetry. I would like to explore marginal and border areas. My guests for this episode are challenging forms and ideas of poetry from very different perspectives. We will talk about conceptual poetry, technology and artificial intelligence as well as performance, multimedia poetry and sound poetry that is as innovative as possible but also rooted in ancient and even mystic traditions. We will also talk about a new international network and community of experimental poetry that my guests have initiated during the corona pandemic. So welcome to our truly intercontinental podcast talk with Felipe Cussen from Santiago de Chile and Martin Baquero, who is also from Chile but is now living in Paris since many years. I know that as artists you pursue very different ways and ideas, but you have also a close connection as friends, collaborators and activists in the international experimental artist scene. So, hola Felipe, hola Martin. It's really great to have you both here today. Hi, <laughs> thank Hi, you very uh, much for inviting us. In a moment, we, 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 with Felipe we are really friends and complementary and, and we have a lot, kind of same taste, in, in, but uh, with different kind of uh, approach to the object mm. of the poem, you know. But uh, w with Felipe, always we have to, we propose things, so I propose things mm. that nobody listens in the world. <laughs> and Felipe, and Felipe, not everything, but when he feels that it could work, he mm. likes to say, okay, mm. let's do it. And he, yeah. he has the, the art, like kind of a sweet discipline at the same time to, to make the things happen in the, in the best manner. We are like uh, complementary, like uh, Ap Apollinio and mm. uh, way. <laughs> Before uh, we go on, maybe it's time to, to get a little more info about you both. <laughs> so these are really bits of pieces I uh, scraped together on the internet about you. If there's anything wrong, so please um, correct me. Um, so about uh, Felipe. Felipe Cussen is a scientific, scientific researcher, author and artist. His main fields of research are experimental literature and mysticism. I hope that is right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. He holds a PhD in humanities and teaches at the University of Santiago de Chile. His projects are often minimalistic and conceptual, like negative poetics is one of your big mm. things. We'll talk about that later which examines the representation of nothingness in literature and visual arts. Big. His latest project is a poetry book. We will talk about that too, The Joy of Rain. Martin Baquero, he's also from Chile, but now I think you're mostly based in Paris for quite some uh -huh. years now. Yeah, He studied electroacoustic composition in Paris, Municipal Music Conservatory, has a PhD in psychopathology. He works mainly as a sound poet and very intense has, is a very intense live performer. Uh, but he also integrates multiple other art forms from film to dance to performance and often collaborates with other artists. Uh, he's also done theater, cinema and radio works and lectures. And outside of this, I think that's very interesting. You work as a psychoanalyst. Is that right? Okay, right. Uh, uh, with yeah. person suffering with severe autism and other such a lot of psychological disorders. Um, and um, the latest publication is a very beautiful and intense uh, record, a protoverb from Barcelona-based, uh, I think, Sonora's label. Is that right? Or is it... It's, it's, a, it's a collaboration between uh, Erratum. Erratum mm. is a label, a sound label of uh, Joaquim Montesui, 
that is like 30 years old and make like a lot of mm. poetry, noise, experimental. And uh, Sonoras is was another project that we have we made with Escofet uh, and Altayu and Tiselli some years ago. Eugenio Tiselli, uh, Edward Escofet and General Altayu. And it's like it started like a kind of a review uh, in Barcelona after it becomes a, a printer. Yeah, mm -hmm. they make like we make like a cycle of uh, performance and little publications in mm -hmm. the set of mm -hmm. that idea started when I, I was uh, Joaquim Montesquieu proposed me a lot of years ago to make an album in his label. I take uh, 10 years to prepare it, you know, I was mm -hmm. like so I didn't know what to do, and in a moment. Uh, uh, we traveled together to 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 Barcelona to meet uh, Edward and, and and Gerard to to create the last track of the album because I, anyway it was a long long magnificent work and I said to to guys hey guys why not we don't create a new uh, collection of uh, some poetry in vinyl uh, and we make that like the sound part in Paris with Joaquim Montesui and the printer side the part and Edward Scofet and Gerard Altayo in the in Barcelona. Let's uh, that is something like that. And my uh, that album was the first of that collection. But my album was bega became a, a collection, and that is great. We are collective, connected yeah. in a way. And I and and that is, I think it's really important uh, in, in poetry and in all life, human, human, Ooh. the connection and the, the the togetherness, you know, and especially in this moment, you know, we got wedding virus. Now it's a war, uh, and what. No, we poets, we can like you know, it's it's important to show uh, that kind of uh, uh, brotherhood. Uh, I don't know how to how to spell it, you know. But I mm. I was I don't know so many times with Felipe like uh, chairing uh, some stage and, and Felipe helped me a lot mm. to finish the the, so, the the performance at the end. Or or, or, or I I know he, he, he never needs, but he needs some help. <laughs> I will be there. I will be there, you know. Of course. Uh, you know, and th there is a kind of uh, generosity mm. and connection and and, mm. and group, uh, yeah. collective mm. uh, capacity of living. And that is, for me, is one of the most important uh, uh, human experience that poetry mm. can aff uh, afford in, in this contemporary world. And I think it, what Martin says, uh, it has to do also because... Uh, uh, we're not competing for anything. I mean, mm. experimental poetry, uh, well, the, there are almost no prizes, no... I, I mean, there are some things you can try to to achieve, but, but it's a more relaxed... I mean, of course, mm. uh, it's not saying that we are like a hippie co community, but I, I usually find that people in, in this field are more relaxed and more eager to, to share, to... Uh, th those are kind of um, I don't know, uh, not so much uh, pos uh, po possessiveness of 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 the work. Uh, so for me, at least, it's, it's like a very relaxed way to to work. Uh, uh, in difference, for example, at the university, at the academy, where there are a lot of competitions and all that. Where when when I'm in talking with you or with other friends, it's more it's more relaxed, and and I really enjoy it uh, for that mm -hmm. also. Since we have already talked about your new sound poetry LP called Protoverb, which is also the result of some intense networking going on between Europe and Chile, I think it's time now to listen to some snippets of this unique and very intense work. All the records actually come in a beautiful hand-printed sleeve. They are very unique works of art. So now let's take a breath and listen to the beginning of Protoverb by Martin Vaquero. <sighs>
I think from listening to the opening track of Protoverb, you can get a little idea of the density and intensity of Martin Baccaro's work and especially his live performances. But before we talk more about your work, Martin, I would like to ask Felipe. Your work is quite different. It's rather controlled, minimalistic, conceptual and rational. It comes in different forms and shapes. Not all of them are easily understood as poetry. A lot of your work is visual. You created a book that is exclusively made up of book cover ideas. You created a series of copied self-portraits that get copied again and again and get worse in quality and then you ask a face recognition software what it sees. But there is also at least one series of sound poems I know of called Quick Faith. And I would like to listen to that first. Quick faith. So, so what is your connection to mysticism and uh, experimental mm. art? I have very different interests uh, in which I'm working. For example, I'm also very interested in pop culture, in pop music and disco music and electronic music, whatever. But since I was 15 and I've been interested in experimental poetry since I was 20 and whatever. And my interest in mysticism is not like, it's not so much a private interest, like a, a spiritual interest. It's more like a formal aesthetic interest i always like to say that what interests me is not the mystical experience because i don't know if if, if that's real i'm mostly atheist so some so one day i believe in god one day not i mean i do not participate in any religion but what interests me is is what happens with, when someone has this kind of experience and tries to tries to express it. That that that's uh that's the problem I'm interested in. When someone like Hildegard von Bingen, for example, uh, she's one of my heroes, sees all that kind of stuff and, and tries to write about it and talks about the problems trying to write about it. And also she imagines things that if you represent them visually as, as they were done in, in a couple of the, uh, their visionary books, you have like really strange images. It's like surrealist images made in 12th century, right? I, I always have this idea that a mystic is an experimental poet, not because he or she likes to, but he or she is obliged to. If you have that kind of experience, you can't write anything normal. You you have to 
break the language or, or do very strange stuff with the language and the images that you have in your in your specific context, of course. But mm. so that that's for me is amazing. And I had the the chance to study at the university with a, a couple of professor professors that were very important to me. And then it was when when I had this class about it was a class about negativity in the troubadours and in the contemporary poetry. And that that's that was when it started my interest in in not only in mysticism but but especially especially in negative theology. And of course, like the most important figure in that tradition is Meister Eckhart, another German guy <laughs> who's really, really important from the 14th century. And this idea that you can't say anything about God, you can't pray to God, uh, you, you have no language to talk about God. So that for me is a very interesting poetic, artistic problem. That's when it, when it mixes. In that part is, is when I, I, I like to think together uh, of mysticism and experimental poetry and, and art. Did you have something that's called the, the office of nothingness or something like that? Yeah. So the idea of nothingness and what to do with it yeah. uh, is also connected to that uh, idea. Exactly. Uh, of the, the office of, theology. Yeah. Exactly. The office of nothingness is an expression by Miguel de Molinos, a mystic, a Spanish mystic from the 17th century. Uh, he also has a, another expression, the the fabric of annihilation is <laughs> very strange expressions. And that, that's the name of the book I wrote, La Oficina de la Nada, uh, Contemporary Negative Poetics, uh, that I published last year with all this research. But also is the name of a group we have with, uh, with Marcela, Megumi and Ricardo. And it's a group we research together and also have a curatorial projects or artistic projects we we organize uh, ex uh, art book festivals, sound installations, etc. So it's a double <laughs> double use of that same expression. I really like the that idea that uh, also mysticism is a really is so crazy that it needs to break any boundaries. Exactly. Boundaries, exactly. You know? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So um, yeah, that's also and, really and, crazy. Idea. And that is why it's, sometimes it's very heterodox. It's strange. Some, sometimes the church like declare that these people are saints, like mm. Hildegard von Bingen, uh, but sometimes they expel them from the church, like Meister yeah. uh, He was prosecuted. He disappeared from, mm. for some years. So it's very strange. Uh, it's always breaking the rules. Uh, mm. But the interesting thing about you is that you also you have this mystic ideas about especially mm. the formal expressions and exactly. ideas about nothingness, mm. but also you, you you have a lot of use of technology. You know, you use yeah. computer language and um, yeah. copy uh, stuff, and uh, but also uh, mm. I think artificial intelligence <laughs> recently. Yeah. So, so yeah. how does that go together? I like very much the the title of the, the this book by uh, Jerome Rodenberg, uh, "Technicians of the Sacred." Well, the, these are the kind of things that we talk a lot with Martin always, mm. and I like this idea of of not not. I mean, uh, to think about technology in every age. I mean, not this idea of that the primitive didn't know about technology. They had their own technologies, different technologies uh, than ours, of course. But this idea and, and kind of art artificiality also, like to produce something mystic or to produce a connection with, with divinity. And you need to make rituals. You need to make, uh, I don't know, prayers together. You need to... I don't know, do a lot of stuff to, to make it work. In my case, of course, the, the, my instrument is the computer, is where I do everything always. And I always, when, when I was a kid, I, I always liked programming. Uh, I mean, very, very simple, of course. But when I had the chance of uh, starting to work with the sound programs and later with synthesizers, effects and all that, I really became crazy. And it, I mean, it's so funny. It's, I, I like very much the idea of poetry as a kind of play. Just, I mean... I, I, to put it more simpler, I I write poetry or make music just not to get bored. I mean, it's the, my main interest, mm -hmm. like to have fun, uh, like a kid. That's that, that's the idea of using technology. Make it's like have moving knobs, and I really have fun when when I do that. So it's not more complex than that. Uh, I think that the, the play mm -hmm. idea is also one of the, the yeah. key mm -hmm. the key ideas uh, in creating art at all, because people get bored, and so yeah. they have to do something. Exactly. They either they either invent technologies uh, that make life easier, exactly. or mm -hmm. uh, they do some creative stuff. Um, we, we call it experimental, but it's just this idea of uh, let's see what happens if 
I try this or if I try that or whatever. Yeah. Right, right, yeah, and uh, I think um, also maybe your your latest project or it's actually a mm. book, and it's it's a real poetry yeah. book. Well, real exactly uh, somehow real uh, poetry book. Yeah, about, for, for me, it's a totally real book. Yeah, it, it's it's a real book. You can buy it, yeah. uh, and it's yeah. about uh, nature, um, which is mm. really great. Um, <laughs> but it's there's something special behind that book too. Uh, so, so maybe can you just tell a little bit about this project? I was hearing a lot about different kinds of. Art artificial intelligence this years, of course, as everyone. And I have made different projects with artificial intelligence, but this is the last one. And it's very simple. It's like writing a book. I don't decide anything in the book. Everything is decided and written by the artificial intelligence. So I asked the artificial intelligence to give me a title of a poetry book. I asked uh, it uh, to give, give me the, t the titles of the poems, then to write the poems. And that was like the most normal part. But what I really enjoyed most was uh, when I asked it to, to write my biography and it was full of errors. I mean, I was born in 1986, but in the reality I was born in 1974. And it, it invented that I, ha I had won so many important prizes in my country, things like that. And, and it also wrote uh, some introduction. And, and I asked the artificial intelligence to give me the names of uh, important poets. Uh, and it gave me the, the name of some poets, some American poets, I think, that I assume they are important, but I haven't read them. So I'm... I guess one one or two of them are, are dead, so so there was some mistake there. So I mean, those errors is what uh, is is the, the part I I really enjoy most. And also, I wanted to make like end the full circle, and and I asked the artificial intelligence to write the post with which uh, I I would be sharing this uh, material online. So the post of on Facebook, on Instagram, on WhatsApp were written by the computer. And at the end, like the, the end of the project was that uh, I asked the artificial intelligence to write a bad review about my book, telling that it was written by an arti artificial intelligence. So that, that was, so the idea was thinking about the book, but also everything around the book, the paratext, mm -hmm. the ways of circulation. That's very important for me always. So that, that was the project. Mm -hmm. So maybe can you just give us a, a little impression how it sounds, uh, this book? Yeah, I, I will read a poem. Let me find it. Ask to the artificial intelligence to read your poem, please. <laughs> like... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I've been working a lot in, in last years uh, uh, about uh, artist books and, and all that. Um, I have a... I have a colleague which I admire very much. She she she's a professor. She lives in Berlin. Uh, Annette Gilbert, maybe you know her. Uh, she has done an amazing job uh, writing about experimental poetry, visual poetry, and all that. And uh, she has um, a writing about an invisible book by Elizabeth Toner. Uh, and 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 in her in her analysis of that book, she says. Uh, you don't need a book to exist, uh, but uh, you need to have a title, uh, an author's name. I mean, you, you can do all the movement of a book, but w without a, a proper book. So it, it's kind of related to that. I, I will read my biography, which is the part of I, I like most. Felipe Carson is a Chilean poet, playwright, and author of several plays and poetry collections. Born in 1986 in Santiago, Chile, Kassan began writing plays in his early 20s, and his first collection of poetry was published in 2009. Kassan's work is often informed by his experience as a Chilean living in a society that has experienced a long history of political and social upheaval. He has, he has written extensively about the impact of the Pinochet dictatorship on Chile, and his poetry often deals with themes of oppression, injustice, and nostalgia. Casson's works has been widely acclaimed, and he has received numerous awards, including the Chilean National Prize for Literature, the Chilean <laughs> Literature Prize, and the Chilean National Prize for Poetry. In addition, he has been a re recipient of the Presidential Medal of Honor of Chile, the highest <laughs> honor bestowed upon a Chilean citizen. Some of those prizes don't even exist, so <laughs> that's amazing. Yeah, that's and, and always, uh, uh, and I, the part I like most is all this cliche of living in a Latin American country yeah, with yeah. dictatorship that 
obviously everyone pretends that you can only write about that and that's the cliche that the artificial intelligence is supplying of course yeah that's, that's really great because it's really exposing these kind of cliches uh definitely exactly it's and, uh, full of cliches So we just heard another example of Philippe Cousin's audio series, Quick Faith, which seems to demonstrate the fun he has in playing with ideas and forms and also in turning knobs around, you know. You can find the whole series on Philippe Cousin's Bandcamp website, which I will put in the show notes. Yeah, that kind of uh, new kind of utilization of uh, of mm. intelligence, of culture creation, you know, and, and Philippe has that great... Uh, the spirit to make like uh, humor to make jokes mm. to make you know like a uh, became uh, in you know, like the change of level of of uh, logic mm. uh, and, so, and that is uh, really really interesting and, and uh, how how you manage the language uh, felipe and, and i mm -hmm. uh, with the years i start to appreciate more and more that for us poets it's really important now to to propose to the world that kind of capacities of deal with the uh, You know, with things, with artificial intelligence, with uh, with fear, with the virus, with uh, everything. Mm. And for me, that uh, that has the connection with mysticism that we have pretty strong with Felipe about that. Uh, that rehearsal of the emptiness of the I don't know the mm. of the everything. I don't know the dissolution of the total massive transformation, mm. transmutation, uh, metanoia's uh, experience of the human that we you go into uh, something and you became transformed you know ramon ramon jules that uh, or ramon mm. dolulio you know mm. i don't know if you know it Dirk, but it's a, a great poet that we mm. I, i remember with felipe was the first poet that we talked mm. about it <laughs> and he was a catalan uh, poet uh, who who created like permutational poetry in the mm. 12th century you know and he created like a concentric circles that you can put some letters in a circle and another circle and you create different poems just mm -hmm. to uh, resolve the problem of three monotheism who make word because they still make word now you know and they okay. want to they create that the, the el arte general para todas las ciencias mm -hmm. la, la, the art the art for to apport to the world a solution of uh, that total all problems uh, yeah. yeah for all the dif difference that create enemies Yeah, that's um, an interesting aspect, especially when you, you talk about its, its transformation. We we talked about mysticism uh, also already, um, exactly. and now and now uh, what poets can bring into the world. And it's I think it's the, also the, the the idea of transforming things. You know, the constant transformation, uh, which is also a transformation between like ideas and language and body uh, and, and uh, different forms, which 
brings me a little bit closer to what, what you're doing, Martin, because mm. uh, I think uh, in contrast to to Ma um, to, Mar uh, to Philippe, you are a much more physical uh, artist. Mm. You know, you, you use your body, your voice very much. You're a performative poet, um, but also use different um, different other uh, genres and 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 uh, visual things and uh, other performance uh, kind of things. Is that also a kind of tr constant transformation going on that your ideas go from like from language to sound, from sound to body, from body to visual? Is, is that a constant transformation you're, you're trying I know. out? <laughs> I love that concept that you just created, constant transformation. <laughs> it's great <laughs> constant constant transmutation or is yeah, it the, the I, same idea that transforms into different uh, yeah different but, forms? but no, yeah no, but not only transform also uh, uh, not only change of, of shape or form also change of material uh, presence you know that is uh, also with Felipe we're really fanatic of alchemy in alchemy you have that capacity of uh transform, you know, the, the things in another thing, the transmutation, also exists in mysticism, the transfiguration that I, I, I experiment a lot with uh, that other kind of mystical people, the, like schizo, schizophrenics or, or, you know, like the people who are classificated in psychosis. Oh. Uh, I work a lot with them and they are totally connected with that, you know, and, that, and a kind of uh, religion in everything. And and the other day, the other day I read a, a, a sentence of a of a, a friend whom who Sean Rigue putting his uh, like an offer for for her daughter. He said, "The life in 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 gift brings to you some stones. It's up to you to make some walls or to make some bridge. It's a, it's connected to me with another a little text of of Freud that that is is really interesting. Call it the poet." Uh, in 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 oh. German, you cor you correct me. The is uh, der Dichter, der Dichter and that's fantasiaren, something like that. You know, <laughs> the, 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 the poet and the, the fantasy. Poet and his yeah. And the, 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 the daydream living. I don't know how to say it. He said uh, uh, to resume to something really interesting. Is like the neurotical. Uh, he 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 say like uh, I. How do you and repress? I repress and my repress. desire. I repress my desire to adapt myself to the other people. The psychotic schizo say, no, I keep my desire at the price of keep me alone of the world. And the poet that he made like uh, the crazy guy, he said, hey, I keep my desire. And I take a little bit of break of the world, a little distance, but I re retake, the, I, I create a new bridge with uh, mm. one new reality, a new kind of mm. appreciate things. I don't know. It's like a, the the capacity of the poet of transmutate or transform mm. the reality. It's not only he, he's experimenting himself in a way, but it's for everyone. Everyone who can, like you know, uh, can can I don't know, read a poem or, or or better read the life of the poets. Because for me, poetry is not only uh, write or not only create. It's it's create, but not only produce. Mm. It's a kind of experience, you know. Uh, it's a kind of uh, ethical uh, um, position of the of the being of the existence. Is there a starting point when you when you try to to create something? Is there a starting point? Do you always start with sound, or uh, is it mm. different for you? I love the thing that I don't understand. Mm. You know, I I I I, I that is when when I feel myself like. A, mm. a, I'm I'm here, you know. I'm not losing my time. Mm. It's when I'm mm. in front of something that I ah, I cannot afford it. There is no mm. language. There is not a connection, mm. and you have to invent it. Mm. You know, it, it, and it could be like a a simple playing uh, of words, uh, a, a sound, a, a, a color, a dream. I, I don't know. It's like a, in a moment that I don't understand what happens, and I need to create my, uh, something mm. for. In this moment, it's, a, it's it became a lot of from sound. You know, before I have a all I have all time, but, but you know, to write things, to write poems in my little book. Now I, I use much more the microphone to take like like a sound notes. So mm. I start to make now a, 
uh, some I want to call it like a, uh, in, in French it's journal de bord is like a, the book that you write in a boat when you are travel, uh, traveling. Oh. Uh, but I call it more like like a, a auto portrait, auto range in, in a way like a, just taking some moments of I don't know. I'm here now talking with Derek and Felipe, and I <laughs> I feel the connection between the black and the white. It becomes a flower, and to not lose mm-hmm. that. And after that, that it, it starts to construct like that, and he can send me to. I used a lot that uh, dictionary of uh, in, in French is more more croisé, means like uh, yeah, uh, uh, crossword. Have, have, yeah, and you have a lot of words. I don't know with different what were ten letters, what were four letters, what seven letters with uh, insects, uh, mm-hmm. in the name of I don't know what the plant. But more and more. I start to believe in in not uh, uh, determinate things, you know. No, I, I don't believe anymore in like uh, the mystical number of seven or five or three. I, I believe in in the square uh, roots of two or square roots of less one, uh, you know, the approximative number. I, I I liked very much what you said about the not understanding a, a, a mm-hmm. historical point. I, I think my way is a little similar, but because it's more related to some technical problem or functional problem or conceptual problem that I want to to solve. I mean, lots of time my, my ideas start when I'm playing with a software or or playing with an instrument and, and I say, what would happen if I mix this with that or if I apply a this uh, procedure and and very much uh, and that's uh, well, that's because of my interest in conceptual writing or conceptual art in general this idea of uh, producing a set of rules and procedures and very arbitrary uh, restrictions to produce something and if it works it, it works and if it do, if it doesn't it, it doesn't and it's no problem and that's why I ended up using artificial intelligence or other softwares it's like that same way of uh, working it, it it always begins with some problem of that kind what do you think about the term nonsense does it apply to any of what you're doing or do you think it's not appropriate uh, um uh, the, uh, the Lord, he make a difference between sense and signification because yeah. you know like, like and, and in, i don't know in, in french also in english a little bit but it's like uh the, mm. you, you have the, the word sense it's not only the meaning it's also the yeah. perception uh, mm. el, el sentido also also mm. in spanish you know como yeah. sintiendo. and mm. that you know spinoza the philosopher talk about, a lot about that, that you know like uh, you, you can live your life like in joy or in sadness in a way you know like if you how you put yourself in in, in that connection and and i think yeah in, in a moment nonsense is like a non servia you know or like a non mm. uh, that kind of moment of the where the human or the poet you have to say no to that mm. uh, or no to this or no to that not to the, you know and but uh how felipe say it's not just there mm. you have to we create a new kind of, um, mm. but sense, but a kind of new kind of uh, perception. You know, a, a poem is always the half part of the poem is made by the poem, and the other half part is made by the the reader or the spectator. You know, and and you you got you you finish that kind of uh, experience of uh, I don't know when you read, I read a Paul Celan poem in a way a woman, and yeah. you can like put top of your body or you know of your human experience in the poem uh, and you complete the poem with him because he has the ability to write in a way that let open the mm. sense you know the signification and that is like uh, uh yeah you talk about neruda or surida and that time mm. well, i love this poem in full respect but at the same time they they close too much a little bit the signification Yeah, talking about uh, not understanding things, about non servium, about the difference between sense and signification, I think it is uh, appropriate to listen to some more of your deep, mysterious, multi-layered sound poetry record, Protoverb.
I was quite surprised really to, to discover mm. experimental poetry, sound poetry, like from South America, from Chile, from, mm. from other countries, from South America, from uh, Mexico and whatever. Mm. And um, I think people in Germany do not really know a lot about it. You know, mm. uh, they maybe know mm. uh, Pablo Neruda. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it usually doesn't. And go Raul Zurita. <laughs> yeah. And it doesn't go very far beyond that. Uh, yeah. What is the state of experimental poetry, especially in, in Chile right now? Is there mm. anything you can say about that uh, in general? I, I, I can say a few things. Um, well, um, I mean, if, if you people from Germany want to start from from a specific place, I think the, the work of uh, Vicente Widovero is, is really important to, to start with. Mm. Uh, he was a Chilean poet from the avant-garde, so uh, I spent a lot of time in Paris. He he was part of the Dada movement. He was in touch with the surrealist. Uh, he founded the creationism uh, and a specific movement. Um, and I think uh, Martin will agree. He's one of the like the most important, like the founder of the tradition of sound poetry in in Chile, uh, at least with with um, an, a specific book called Altazor. Uh, that in the last part of that book uh, is just uh, pure phonetic poetry, like futurist poetry. So that's um, an, a very important figure. But uh, if you study like more in general, like the Chilean tradition, there are a lot of examples of visual poetry, uh, poets working with um, with typography, uh, with the layout of the of the page. Uh, there's a very important poet uh, called uh, Juan Luis Martinez in, in the 70s and the 80s. And there's also a very important poet that worked in Chile and then went to Bulgaria and later to Germany, to Halle. Uh, he, he's mm -hmm. called uh, Guillermo Deisler. He died in 1995, but he, he was an amazing visual poet, very important creator of networks of male art. And he made most of his job uh, in, in Germany. So it's uh, one of our common relationships we have with the, with the German tradition. And I think like there has been a, a very important movement of experimental poetry since the end of the 90s and especially uh, the beginning of the 2000s uh, when Martin Gavins, Martin Baquero, uh, Andres Zambanter, Gregorio Fontaine, Ana Maria Bride, uh, me and other people founded the Writers Forum in Chile was like a Chilean version of the writers, the English uh, Writers Forum of Bob Coving. But I must say that I think like in the first five or 10 years of our work, nobody took us seriously, at least in the literature world. We immediately developed uh, uh, links with people from visual arts and performance and music. Uh, for example, we, we were very much in touch with uh, Cecilia Vicuña. Uh, she's also one of the most important poets, but also artists and sound artists in, in Chile. The, uh, tomorrow there's a, a new exhibition of her work uh, here, just one, one block from, from my house. Uh, and she, she has earned a lot of recognition in last years, happily. It took a lot of time uh, for people to took us seriously, but at least they saw that there was something going on and, and we persisted doing the, no matter what they say. So yeah, I think, for example, now for our, for a kid or a young poet, uh, if he or she starts mixing poetry and performance and music, probably they have seen uh, part of our work and also of work, the work of people from other countries. Uh, there has been some poetry and music festivals also that has, have been really important. So, so I think now uh, there's a very very active community here in Chile and and something that I like very much, like people from from normal or textual poetry are starting to to think of different mixes and different combinations and also working with musicians and visual artists, whatever. So I think nowadays it's very active and very vibrant uh, mm. uh, community. And do you think, is there any uh, specific um, characteristics about the experimental scene in, in Chile that mm. is maybe a little different from Europe or uh, North America? Or is there anything that is more characteristic mm. to, to Chile? If, if, if you ask me more broadly about uh, Chilean poetry in general, I would say that, that there's a good deal of poets that 
are very self-conscious of writing, are very ironic, uh, and that uh, has, has to do a lot with a very important figure called Nicanor Parra, who was the founder of the anti-poetry. And it's a very funny poet, but also a poet that uh, is always like making laugh of their uh, of of the ridiculous act of uh, doing poetry. For example, mm. in my case, I mean, uh, it, it has been a big influence uh, for me. He didn't do sound poetry, but he did uh, visual poetry. Um, but this idea of not taking poetry too seriously, I think is very common in Chile, not of all the poets, but it's an important tradition. That I would say that, that has to be, but if you look at the people that are doing sound poetry, for example, it's uh, it's, it's very wide, uh, and there are people like uh, oh, uh, I don't know, Luna and Adria, for example, that work more with a performance, uh, and others that work more with the phonetics of the voice. Uh, but others like Martin Gavis, uh, Martin Baquero, and me, who like to use more the technology. I, I specifically like to use a lot of the, the computer and not using my body. But Mar Mar Martin, for example, he's a very good performer and he uses his body and moves and all that. So, um, the, But I think that there are a lot of... Uh, I mean, I wouldn't characterize something very specific in experimental uh, poetry in Chile right now. I don't know how you see it, Martin, but... Um... No, I think, I, yeah, at the same time was uh, the beginning of, or, I don't know, uh, hmm. I remember we met uh, together with Felipe yeah. in, in, in Paris because I, uh, another project we organized with uh, the guy of the Cultural Embassy of Chile wanted hmm. to organize like a contemporary poetry in in Europe, and, uh, and we talked with uh, some friends, Andres Ambanter, uh, oh. uh, Felipe, uh, and we talked about that poets outside of the language, in a way, living in another language, oh. and uh, re recover the language for a moment and to, to talk in, in that. And that was the first time that I met Felipe, and we oh. became really, you know, oh. quickly close, and we visited together the next day. There was all interesting, oh. mystic places, Ramon <laughs> Blum, yeah. You know, Kabbalah <laughs> and all that and stuff, and, and and say, okay, Felipe, let's go to a. At, at Felipe was uh, sleeping really early, and me was like in party all night long with poets. And but <laughs> at the morning, Leo, at nine, we were together to the museum. And yeah, from exactly. that moment, uh, Felipe started. You know, we we, we believed in, in each other in, in that way, mm. and and then I, I met uh, uh, Martin Gavins in in London. Uh, mm. Because he, uh, Luna Nedra Montenegro, you know, a group that Felipe took already, and, and Martin Gavins was mm. living in, in London, and we yeah. went to the Writers Forum session. And this was, I don't know, a, a big discovery for all of us because we came from Chile, you know, all the, in the 90s, all the group of uh, poetry, uh, you know, poetry club or poetry, mm. the Academy Pablo Neruda, you know, you, mm. if you want to. Uh, participate on the the group of poets. Mm. It was so sarcastic mm. between them, mm. so destroying mm. each other. No, you don't know mm. how to write. You know, it was terrible for me. It was no, mm. no, thank you. I don't want to participate mm. in that kind of a uh, relationship mm. between between poets, between human beings. And in in mm. write, uh, writers' forum, we really experimentate another kind of reception of poetry. It, mm. it was like I don't know. I, I don't know if you ever if you ever been there, Dirk or. or so it was like uh, I don't know. We were like forty people, forty all poets mm. from different kind of poetry, more text, more sound, without uh, letters, uh, with letters, language, not language, uh, and it was a totally free expression and a total respect and a communion. You know, it was like a kind of circle, and the poets like you know, like a battle of of uh, hip hop. Without you know that you know, and like we go in the middle or dancers. You know, uh, to, to you. You made your poetry, and everyone was like uh, uh, appreciating in a way, reception. Uh, like uh, you feel insecurity to be experimental. Mm. And, mm. Uh, and and when Martin Gavin returned to Chile, uh, he he was so sad because he said, "I will not find that spirit in in, mm. in any part of the world." And and we said, "Martin, let's create that. Uh, contact Felipe Gas and contact Andres Convant. You know." Mm. And we start to make that. That uh, that we have to create that spirit of 
uh, of togetherness, like we said from the beginning, mm. between poets. And uh, and the four of the escritores start to exist, and it was a really, really great moment. And I think it's, it's it opened, like Felipe said, a space mm. of, of uh, mm. contemporary artists that we met together in the same bar that we started mm. meeting like uh, 12 years ago. It went like a, a bar who nobody knows, like only people from office after, you know, was totally mm. unknown. And we start to make uh, once a month, the Saturday, or once a week mm. in a moment, mm. uh, some meetings and, and, and people came from uh, visual art, from architects, from, I don't know, different, like a kind of new uh, artist interest in that free expression because it was not like that destroying uh, thing that language uh, you know the, the the poets who feel themselves like mas master of good writing you know like <laughs> they know how mm -hmm. to write and they say that you know I will, will not see some names but you know say like, we get, like I, I am the best poet of the town you know like say it in that moment and uh and I think it was really important that that uh, work that Felipe Casen and Martin Gavins make uh, mm. in Chile are to okay. Uh, I don't know when Felipe support a project, he's there, you know, and you can <laughs> believe in him because the thing will happen. And and that is was a fantastic moment. Mm. And uh, and at the same time, that uh, make us know another movement in in the different exactly. parts of the world, mm. in in Argentina. Uh, with people, uh, Nacar, the uh, Station Alogen, you know, uh, the, the Rodolfo, all the all those poets from Argentina and Uruguay and uh, Clemente Padin and all the people from there in Brazil, in Mexico, in uh, England. Uh, you know, when, when, when we stayed with Felipe some weeks ago in mm. Wales, you know, and and we met some poems that we mm. knew by just by... You know, like <laughs> all of us had interest in in experimental poetry, uh, but that interest interest uh, developed when we went to study abroad. Martin went to France. Uh, Martin mm -hmm. Gavin and Andres Sambanter went to England. Anna Maria Bride went to Germany. I went in, but specifically, I went to Catalonia, and I had the chance to uh, attend the experimental poetry festivals organized by Eduardo Escofet. I always say, mm. Eduard, that uh, I learned everything about sound poetry just going to those festivals. When we started like developing our, our own works, we were very much aware of what was happening, at least in some parts of, of Europe and, and also in other countries. And that is very important because I, I think one of the main problems of experimental poetry or innovative or avant-garde poetry, as, as you want to, to call it, is like thinking that, that you are the first to do something. And mm -hmm. and I always like to remind that there's there are traditions, there are people that have been researching and developing projects in, in, in sound, in visual uh, poetry. So it's very important, as in like in the normal poetry, to read, to to know what, what has been done, uh, to talk with other people, to share materials. It's the same as, as in any other kind of art. So I think that is, that's important because I, I have seen, of course, like people that think that they are uh, doing something really, really new, and it's not quite that. But is there something that you say that... People like in, in Germany, especially or in, in Europe, that need to know uh, for for poetry, for new poetry. Or you say it's it's really important uh, to know this poet or this poet's book or this artist. Mm. Is there any recommendation you have? More than more than just a poem, I I, I would think it, it would be interesting uh, for for anyone is aware of some poetry and all that, to check a uh, Festival PM uh, website. Uh, Festival PM is a project that has organized a lot of poetry and music festivals, but it goes from like people singing songs to a uh, performance, to readings only with the voice, rock groups, experimental things with computers. It's really, really broad, uh, the kind of things they, they have been organizing project is, is still going on and I think it, it's a very good way to, to see what has been happening in Chile but also in Latin America uh, and with some guests from Europe so it's, it's a good opportunity I think to see what's going on uh, in that intersection of mm -hmm. poetry and music. Okay, you Festival have to... PM. 
Well, that sounds fantastic. So please check out Festival PM or Festival Poesia y Musica Chile. I will put the link in our show notes. Speaking of poetry and music, I would like to play one more example of Philippe Gusson's Quick Faith. At the beginning of this episode, I mentioned that you both uh, were also involved in creating a much bigger international network of sound poets and artists working on the borders of poetry. It's called Language is a Virus, and the main features of that early network were regular weekly meetings on Zoom, combining talk and performance and just being together somehow. Um, and it was also a idea that came up during uh, the corona pandemic, especially in the beginning of that uh, pandemic. Can you talk about this project and how it started and what your ideas about this uh, were? We was in the beginning of the pandemic. I don't know how we start, but we talk with Felipe and we say, well, Felipe, we need something, you know, that's the world is totally uh, under a strange thing. We didn't understand nothing. We have uh, closed ourselves in our cluster. And we say, like poets, we need to organize something and open a, a space for that poetry could exist in that totally strange world. Why not we invite uh, different poets from all the world and we, we open like a kind of bar or coffee, coffee uh, in the cloud to everyone knows that we are there and what we think about uh, that happens, the virus, etc. No? And then we start to talk about William Burroughs and the idea of language is a virus from outer space. That's an old idea of the philosopher Anaximenes. Yeah, that, that was uh, the first idea just to be together. I mean, lo lots of people started having meetings uh, with the friends, but via Zoom. Uh, in our case, it was, uh, first of all, like meeting with, with some of our close friends. But uh, After a while, it started to, to develop as a, as a network. It's great because it's a, a beautiful tradition in experimental poetry of networks. I mean, concrete poetry, male art, uh, net art. It's very common that uh, experimental artists try to be 
in touch, to, to work together, considering that usually the work of any experimental artist is kind of lonely in, in their specific context. But you find relationships with people from very different parts of the world that are doing kind of the same things. There were very much people, I mean, like 50 people were participating in, uh, regularly uh, in 52 sessions we made. It was a whole year. It started, uh, as, as Martin says, like uh, getting together in the beginning. But after that, he wrote a paper together uh, with Martin and Rachel Robinson. It became also a research. Uh, af after finishing this first cycle, uh, it was a research, like a, we think, like a very good uh, and complete overview of, of what's happening right now in, in different countries about sound poetry, experimental poetry, performance, whatever. It has been for me one of the most rewarding um, projects I, I've been uh, involved in, in last years and it was completely spontaneous. I mean mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you 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 prepare something a lot and, and you have a lot of expectations but we, we didn't have any expect expectations when when we started this it was just uh, the need to be together and it ended up being a, a very good uh, way to communicate to learn I was able to to talk uh, and and to share my ideas with a lot of poets I've been studying like you Dirk <laughs> in fact I yeah. uh, I've been studying your work uh, some years ago uh, but we, we have only uh, exchanged emails, so now we could uh, talk like every week. It was amazing with you, with uh, uh, George Peeringer, uh, Joaquin Montesu, uh, So Scolding. I, I met her during this project and lots of other more people. So really, really rewarding experience. And mm. it was a work in progress permanently, mm. you know, and mm. and the the shape that it takes at the at the end like uh, some poet presents and at the at the end mm. a collective improvisation mm. was uh, uh, I, I don't know I, I, I crossed a rehearsal about uh, what mm. is the best you know uh, let's uh, mm. let's invite that poet you know and, mm. and but little by little was like a kind of uh, yeah togetherness you said I think mm. it's really important that in, in especially mm. in some poetry I think we have a kind of uh, uh, yeah, close uh, relationship, like a friendship uh, between us, uh, and uh, and it's rare in the other side of the poetry. I think it's more mm. we are more close. It's more easy to to meet us, like some poets, than like textual or classical poets. And that is like I think it's one of the most beautiful things of some poetry. That kind of uh, mm. togetherness uh, and and, other, and also with other arts, because some poetry mm. is more easy mixed all with. Uh, Painting, dance, uh, you don't know, mm. because we have not that virus of language in a way. Mm. We are immune mm. to that, uh, mm. you know, because we go before or beyond language. Then language for, for us is not more an enemy. Mm. And that's maybe that the, the the inner idea, subconsciousness at all of mm. that uh, project. It was how we can share between us uh, with the world that kind of immunity of some poets uh, as uh, that idea of a virus the language like a virus yeah all the language is the virus talks and sessions are actually online on youtube i put a link in the show notes which are probably getting quite long now so uh, you stress the importance of connecting of creating togetherness for poetry and art which is sometimes actually easier if you go beyond language so one of the things that impressed me most during the language is the virus sessions where the spontaneous improvised sound sessions at the end of the talks and since we're all coming from different language backgrounds, these sessions created a connection between all of us without the use of any regular language. So I thought maybe uh, to the end of our talk, we could also try a short sound session between us, between Santiago de Chile, uh, Paris and Frankfurt. So what do you think? Shall we start our impro? Are you ready? Yeah. Zukunft steht still, 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 Zukunft steht still,
Stuhl silent. Stuhl still silent. Stuhl. Stuhl steil. Zu. Steil. Zu. Chair. Zu. Chair. Still. Still. Thank you so much, uh, Felipe and uh, Martin Vaquero. And we should again name your la latest works. Uh, Felipe Kusten, you have this uh, project. It's mm. called The Joy of Rain. So it's a real yeah. poetry book you can buy, I guess, yeah. online or wherever. On lulu.com. But uh, uh, as always, uh, everything that I published, uh, at least my poetry works, is available to download via PDF in my mm -hmm. website, felipecasten.net. Yeah, we'll put that, that in the show. Oh, notes. great. Martin, your latest work has been a uh, sound poetry uh, CD, uh, not CD, LP. Uh, <laughs> LP, yeah. yeah. LP, protoverb it's called, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's it's a really, it's a beautiful work. I just beautiful. got it not too long ago, actually. <laughs> so I'm really happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it's it's really beautiful, but, and it's also a very, very intense uh, sound landscape kind of thing and um yeah so i can really recommend that i'll put that in the show notes thank you so much for joining this podcast uh, felipe thank and martin you. thank you to you thank you to organize things to be like uh you know like you are yeah. not not only a great performer great poet also you organize you create new space in the human existence Thank you. Yeah, we really thank appreciate you so it. Yeah. Thank you so much. So you heard the second episode of Possible Poetry. My name is Dirk Hulstrung. My guests were Felipe Kussen and Martin Baquero. And you'll find more information about my guests in the show notes on the Podigy blog. If you don't want to miss new episodes, please subscribe to Possible Poetry on Podigy. But you can also find Possible Poetry on Spotify, Apple, Google Podcast, on YouTube, actually. And now also on the great uh, podcast platform for literature. Uh, it's called Lit Radio in Germany. Thank you and hope to hear and see you again soon, Philippe and Martin. Thank you very much. Thank you, our friend Dirk. We love you. Possible Poetry.